Hey, thanks for downloading this week's episode of Cross Defense. You're about to hear John Warwick Montgomery teach us about democracy and Christianity, and then Reverend Sam Schulteis comes back to tell us more about the imagination, this time from the New Testament. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to another episode of Cross Defense. I am your host, the Reverend Tyrell Bramwell, a pastor in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and the guy talking into the microphone right here, right now at KFUO.org. It is a pleasure to wear all of those hats, among the others that I wear. It is good to be back with you guys in the, uh, the studio as we broadcast worldwide right here on KFUO.org. You know what? I miss a Monday which I got to say, I'm sorry I missed last Monday at that rerun. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, when I miss a Monday, I feel it. It's similar to, not quite at the same level as missing a Sunday. When you miss church on Sunday, don't you feel a little bit out of sorts, a little bit out of whack? Your whole week is just kind of turned upside down. Something's missing. Something's off. It's kind of like that. Not quite the same, but kind of like that. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just glad to be back with you. This is the show, Cross Defense. This is the show where we equip the mind excite the imagination, and comfort the soul, all with God's Word, and for a particular purpose. And that purpose is because we have a fierce foe out there. The devil and his demons, they are real and they are relentless. And our only defense, our only defense is Christ on the cross. Our own sinful Adam is constantly nagging, constantly working against our new man, our sanctified holy man. And so we need Christ on the cross and the world itself, the sins of others, the flesh that abounds in this world, the sinfulness. It too is working to tempt us into evil. And so we need Christ on the cross. Our only defense is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to talk about democracy, democracy and Christianity. But before we do that, I just want to give a shout out to a listener. I'm not going to say her name because I don't know if she would like me to. I received an email. I just want to read what she said. Um, Just thanking you, listener. You know who you are for taking time to email me. She says, wow, so glad you're doing Monday on KFUO. Can't wait till Monday to be with you again. These past two Mondays, you make the goal of the show come true. And I want to just tell you that you sent it to me in an email. So you never told me if I could share this publicly. So I won't mention your name, but you know who you are. Thank you so much for taking the time to email me. I appreciate the listener feedback. Uh, it, does, it does help me gauge where we're at on content and style and we start to develop the show into something that is a little more uh, mine, I suppose, as we're now out of the uh, temporary host sort of uh, vibe and into the Tyrell Bramwell host. It's, it's really helpful. I had a wonderful conversation with the program director here at KFUO not too long ago and looking forward to the future. I'm kind of doubling down on my efforts here on the show, making sure that I spend the time, the time you deserve, the time the show deserves to deliver high quality content. And uh, that's, that's the goal. And so as we've uh, kind of made that our goal to receive an email like that was just very timely and well appreciated. So thank you so much. If you listener out there want to email, contact me about anything, you want to feedback on the show or comments or thoughts, criticism, um, any kind of, Anything, theological conversation, I will get to you just as soon as I can. So thanks for listening, everybody. Really appreciate it. Let's get into today's show. Uh, we're going to talk about something that I think is is needed. We're going to talk about dem- democracy, but we're also going to talk about Christianity, the relationship between the two. So, let me just back up a little bit. Reading, give you a little context. Reading is such a great pastime. If you will, allow me to recommend something radical to you. And this is all on topic, I promise. But allow me to, to recommend that you unplug from social media, that you read a little more. Read some books. If you follow me on my social media pages, you know that I'm in the middle of prayerfully considering my own activity online. Now, this, is a, this is a common thing, right? I'm sure at any given moment right now, all of you, any of you, you right there in particular, yes, I'm talking to you, that you probably know five people online who at any given moment are talking about considering 
threatening to get off of social media. It's just a common thing. It's the reality we live in. Last week, I was talking with the seminarian, and it came up that with respect to social media, he's been clean for a couple of years now. That's how he said it. He's been clean. And he was only half kidding. As a society, we're starting to recognize that it can be an addiction and a dangerous one that can do real harm to relationships and livelihoods. So, as I said, do yourself a favor. And when you feel that urge to check your social media, to, to pull up that app on your phone, when you feel that, that pull, like you need to take a smoke break. Uh, that's how it used to be for smokers. If you're not a smoker, it's the same sort of addictive desire to reach in your pocket. And instead of pulling out that pack of smokes, to pull out your phone and check your Instagram, check your Facebook. So when you feel that urge, just uh, crack open a book, read a book and learn something, grow as a person, get a little deeper. Okay, so I bring that up because, as I said, Reading is such a great pastime. And you might have noticed that I like to refer to information on this show from the books in my library. That's where the knowledge that I have comes from. This past week, I was thinking about the current affairs in the United States of America, in, our, in, in my country. I don't know where you're listening, but if you live in the U.S., I was thinking about our political system and especially all the executive orders that President Biden has already signed. I don't know if you saw these news articles, but he's been signing executive orders like crazy. And it made me start to think about this. According to a, a post at CNN.com, as of February 2nd, so already it's a little dated, so who knows what's happened since then, President Biden has signed 45 executive orders, actions, and memorandums. And I, I don't know the distinction between that. So somebody else have to look that up if you want to know. That sounds like a lot of signing, a lot of executive order type stuff happening in one month's time. And then I was reminded as I was thinking about that, of what's going on in my former home state of California with the effort to recall Governor Newsom, which made me think about some of the conversations I had in the beginning of this whole pandemic thing that we're dealing with, about whether or not governors were acting beyond their vocational boundaries, their authority. And all of this led me to the thoughts expressed in John Warwick Montgomery's book from 1970, The Suicide of Christian Theology. In it, he address addresses a question that you might find helpful when it comes to living out your faith in America, in a, in a country that is a democratic republic, a democracy, as we call it, in shorthand. But really, it's helpful no matter where you live or what form of government that is in your country. His thoughts are extremely valuable. Now, all the current events that I just mentioned have to do with his question, what connection, if any, exists between Christianity and democracy? And he follows that question up with another question. <laughs> surprise, surprise. What does the Christian message have to say about our responsibility, the Christian's responsibility, in a democratic society? This is important stuff. We just came through an election. We have all kinds of turmoil happening in our country because of our election and our process. And what I would say, it's devolution. It's decay. The fact that the process is sort of, sort of starting to come undone in a very violent and disturbing way. These are simple questions. What connection, if any, exists between Christianity and democracy? And what does the Christian message have to say about our responsibility, your responsibility as a Christian in a democratic society? All right, so let me know if Montgomery's answers to these questions are beneficial to you on this topic. We're going to take a look right now. Here's what the apologist has to say. 
to determine the true attitude of Christianity to democracy, it is necessary to look not at the history of the church, which is by definition composed of sinful men who have often erred, but at the Holy Scriptures, which provide the only proper norm of the church's teaching. And let me just say, as an aside note here, that this is, this is true in, in all matters not just politics and, and the topic of democracy. I know too many people who focus on the sins of the Christian, on Christians, on the church, rather than on the grace of God. Too many people who discount the love of the bridegroom, the husband, on account of the infidelity of his bride, the church. When we first look at the love of Jesus, who is the Word. The Word of God made flesh. He is Scripture made flesh. Then we can see the church properly. But we first have to start by looking at Jesus, looking at God's Word. Then, when we look at the church, and when we see Christians sinning, the bride's trespasses won't be used by our old evil foe and our sinful Adam and the world to keep us away from the love of our Lord. So that, that's just, just a side. I know we just got started in Montgomery's quote here, but just to kind of recap there, that if you want to know how the Christian is to behave, you don't look at the Christian. You look at Christ. You look at Scripture, God's Word. What does what does Christian teaching say? Not, not how is it being implemented and how is it being lived out? Now, that's a whole other show. That's only going to get you so far on any topic. we got to go to the source. we got to go to the Bible. There, there we can see what ought to be to help us shape what will be our actions, our, our lives. Okay? So to determine the true attitude of Christianity to democracy, it is necessary to look not at the history of the church, but at the Holy Scriptures, which provide the only proper norm of the church's teaching. Okay, Mon Montgomery continues on the topic of government, democracy, as it relates to Christianity. On the one hand, we find that Scripture presents no single governmental form as obligatory. God doesn't command us to have a certain type of government, certain form. The theocracy, Montgomery says, of Israel, as the Puritans failed to notice, was ideal only for Israel as the vehicle of God's revelation preparatory to the advent of Christ. Barth, Karl Barth, Montgomery says, was quite right to tell the East German pastors that they could serve God in a communist land. And in fact, had a divine responsibility to do just that. And here he references Romans 13. Now, I know having heard that, I mean, I'm going to repeat this, this part that might be a little hard for you to swallow. He says it was right to tell the East German pastors that they could serve God in a communist land. Some might hear that and balk at it, have a knee-jerk reaction to it. No, nah, no, nah, that's not right. Divine responsibility to serve in a communist land. That's hard for the American ear to hear. I just don't think that's right, you might be saying. But no, let's, let's look at it. It is right. See, we serve wherever we live. We've been blessed to live in a democratic society, to live in America. Others are blessed in their own way to live in their own society. Under whatever form of government exists in our land, in your land, you are blessed to be there, to serve there. That's where God has put you. And that's where you get to serve your neighbor. It is a blessing to do that. There is a divine responsibility to live out your life so that others around you hear the gospel, see the gospel in action, so that when, when people do look at the church, Hopefully, ideally, they don't see the sins of the bride, but they see the sinlessness, the righteousness 
of the bridegroom of Christ. That's our aim. That's our goal. We want to, we want to get out of the way. And so we aim. We want to live as is appropriate where we live, where we're born, where we've been raised, where we're at. And that may change, but wherever we live, the idea is to, to serve as is appropriate in that society. This reminds me of what the Reverend Richard Wormbrand has to say about all of this in Torture for Christ. But before we get to that, quote, we're going to take a break. If you're liking what you're hearing, don't go away. You're listening to Cross Defense. I'm the Reverend Tyrell Bramwell. We'll be back in the Five Minutes with a Missionary opens a window into missionary life. LCMS missionaries share an unfiltered take on life abroad for the sake of the gospel, all in the time it takes to pick up your drive through order or empty the dishwasher. It's fun, it's personal, it's real, and it's always an adventure. Find this podcast on kfuo.org or anywhere you get your podcasts. <laughs> we are back. Sorry to leave it hanging like that. It was a rotten thing for me to do, I realized, but I was working at the clock and it was time to take a break so that we could fit in all the content in a good and orderly way. So uh, let me recap what we were talking about just before I mentioned Reverend Wormbrand and his book, Torture for Christ. You may be familiar with that from The Voice of the Martyrs. A uh, very well-known book. It has been published and published and published and handed out and it is uh, just a, it's a great resource. But what brought that up was this idea that Montgomery says Carl Barth was right, which already that might be controversial enough, that Carl Barth was right when he said that the East German pastor was right to serve God in a communist land, that it's doable. And we started talking just a little bit about uh, living in different types of government in the world and you know, how that might sound strange to the American ear. We, we Maybe not so much anymore, actually. Uh, the, the newer generation is not seeing the evils of communism for what they are. And so uh, communism is kind of starting to creep back in. We had a show about that earlier with uh, Reverend Ross. Brandon Ross was on the show. We talked about Marxism and socialism and things like that. So I'll refer to that episode if you're interested. So leading into this comment about Reverend Richard Wormbrand, he says in his book, Tortured for Christ, about his time in a communist prison, that it was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners, as it is in captive nations today, he says. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this, this preaching, received a severe beating. A number of us, he says, decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. So we accepted their terms. I love this language. It was a deal. We preached and they beat us. We were happy preaching. They were happy beating us. So everyone was happy. Isn't that awesome? I mean, just... It, that, that, my friends, is Christianity. That is how we witness. That is how it is right for the pastor to serve in a communist land or in any land that is hostile to the preaching of the gospel. That, my friends, is a faith that is willing to die. And you notice the language that Reverend Wormbrand uses. The language. It wasn't just that they were prepared to preach and to suffer the beating. No, they were happy to preach. Just as the communist prison guards were happy to beat them for doing so, everyone was happy. <laughs> this, this is what it means to be a Christian, to rejoice in suffering. The goal of the Christian isn't rebellion. No, no, no. The goal of the Christian is fidelity to God's word. And sometimes that may mean our actions are perceived as rebellious. They're not. They're faithful. Now, sure, you could say that Reverend Wormbrand was rebelling against the authorities of the prison guards. Okay, but what does the authority of God's word say about what a pastor is to do, what a Christian is to do? Pray. Preach. Spread the love of Christ. That, then, is more of an authority. It trumps the authority 
the earthly authority of the prison guards. And, and you, you might even be able to say, you can say, maybe we should take, do a whole show on this. It definitely fits the cross defense. And I think, just as a side note, we are going to shift, I think, back more toward apologetics in the show. It's just such good stuff. You can say that the, it's the prison guard who's actually rebelling. It's the, it's the temporal authority. Romans 13, read that. And you understand it appropriately. It's the earthly authorities who are breaking their vocational duty. They're going against their responsibility in their vocation. When they're going beyond their bounds, it's it's them who are rebellious, not the, the subject, not the person who's receiving the consequences of the authority's rebellion. You understand? It's it's not the the Christian pastor in a communist prison who's preaching even though he knows the rule says he's not supposed to, he's not the, re- the rebel. He's not the one rebelling. The, the, the rebellion falls on the Communist Party punishing the Christian for doing what God said to do. And now, here's the thing. The Christian's just being faithful. But the earthly consequences still remain. We never say that that's not going to go away. Reverend Wernbrand and, and every martyr under the sun understood that what they were about to do was going to have earthly consequences. There are earthly punishments for the things we do, and that's not to change just because we live in the 21st century. The responsibility to serve is still there, even when the environment is hostile to God's word. And I think the American Christian church, the, perhaps the Western Christian church, needs to come back to terms with that. We need to, we need to revisit that idea. Now, uh, here's the situation that I'm confronted with. It means I'm going to have to stop having church. It means I'm going to have to stop preaching. Is that okay with God? No. Okay, so what's the consequence? The consequence could be jail time. The consequence could be penalties, fines, citations. The consequences could be public disapproval, a lowering of my of the public opinion poll of the church. So what, right? We we need to realize there are going to be earthly consequences, and so we can be prepared to be okay with that. As Paul says, it's not about the opinions of men. That's not what matters to Paul, as he has become a slave to Christ, a servant to Christ. The only opinion that matters is Christ's. It's God's. Okay, so back to Montgomery. Back to Montgomery. Now that we got that sorted out, it is okay to, to just... Faithfully be a Christian in a communist land or in any land that is hostile to Christianity without citing a rebellion. That's okay. Our our aim is not to be rebels. If our actions appear to be so, that is not what we set out to do. What we set out to do would be faithful to God's word. Let the earthly consequences unfold as they will. That's not none of our concern. Back to Montgomery. But just as the scripture without explicitly condemning slavery, condemned it by the gospel, which sets men free. So the New Testament message provides irresistible impetus toward more democratic government, i.e. toward government in the hands of the people. Jesus said, let no man among you be called master, for ye are all brethren. It's a, you go to Matthew 23, 8, 9, 10 uh, to find that kind of language. You can also see Matthew 20, 24 to 27 more of that kind of stuff. The one man he called a fox was a king. Now, Bishop Burgrav, who was a Norwegian Lutheran bishop who resisted the Nazi occupation during World War II, Montgomery says, quite rightly asserted that the cornerstone of democracy was, however, laid when Christ proclaimed that a man's soul is worth more than the whole world. Interesting. A man's, when, when the reality, the truth was revealed that a man's soul is worth more than the whole world, therein was the cornerstone. Christ is the cornerstone. But in this case, the cornerstone of democracy. Montgomery continues in the central Christian doctrines of sin and grace, the relation of Christianity to democracy becomes crystal clear. Scripture asserts that there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 22 and 23. And because of this universal human predicament, the gospel is declared that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. 
Listen to this. If all are sinners, then the best form of government is the one that prevents any one sinner from gaining absolute control over the rest. That's, that's what I was thinking about when I started pondering all the current affairs today, all the executive orders and the recall of, of governors and, and whether governors have been operating according to their vocation. That's, this right here is what I was thinking about from Montgomery's works. I want to read it to you again. If all are sinners, then the best form of government is the one that prevents any one sinner from gaining absolute control over the rest. And if all are potential recipients of God's saving grace, then the best government is the one that permits each person to contribute the most to the well-being of his fellows. Uh-huh. So here we go. We're getting an answer to the relationship between Christianity and democracy, but also the second question that Montgomery poses, what is our responsibility as Christians in this society that is democratic in nature? So let me read that once again. This is our answer. We're going to talk more about it in just a second. But if all are sinners, then the best form of government is the one that prevents any one sinner from gaining absolute control over the rest. Okay, Democracy does that. Democratic Republic. And if all are potential recipients of God's saving grace, then the best government is the one that permits each person to contribute the most to the well-being of his fellows. I have news for you, my friends. We live in a democracy, shorthand, and that means we get to participate. In fact, you want that to be the case, that you get to participate for the well-being of your fellow man. And here in our form of government, the way it was originated, we get to do that most easily, most effectively. When we lose democracy, we lose a very good tool that enables the Christian to serve his neighbor. And as we're sitting around not serving our neighbor already, as we're letting other people participate in our democratic process, and we are sitting back doing nothing, hanging out on the couch, watching the the masked singer, dancer with stars guy, whatever it may be, I don't know. When we're doing that, we're actually shirking our responsibility. When you were born in a democratic country, when you were born in the United States of America, you were born with a certain vocation. You are a citizen of this land. And if you are not participating in our form of government, at some level, local is best, if you're not participating, then you are shirking the responsibilities of your vocation as a citizen of the United States of America. Same is true for anywhere you live, although your participation in your government, in your country, may be limited and may have a different shape. But what we're saying is that we we all need to participate. You can refer to a couple of my interviews with Pastor, Pastor Toma about that, as he is very active in that regard. Continuing with Montgomery. Since a man is never perfect, he must always be checked by his fellows. Or tyranny will loom on the horizon. And since no man can ever be more saved than another, for salvation is God's work for all men, not man's work for God, No one has the right to lord it over his neighbor in the political realm. In spite of its limitations, democracy has been found experientially to provide the greatest fulfillment of these ideals. It is unquestionably the best government for sinners saved by grace. That's what we are. At the same time, sinner and saint. And if we are truly sinners and saints... The best form of government for us, as Montgomery puts it so well, is a democracy. There's no no king. There's no one above another. Thus, it is not strange, he says, that democracy has flowered not in the East, but in the West, where the Christian faith has served as the religious cement for civilization. Hmm. Interesting stuff, right? Interesting stuff. Does it make sense? Are you getting it? Let me know. Send me an email. Go to tyrellbramwell.com. You can use the contact button there at the bottom of the homepage. Let me know. I find this to be very helpful, apologetically, in explaining why democracy, why the American form of government that we know is, is to be preserved, why we should 
appreciate it. Right now, I don't think our society teaches an appreciation. Even in our own land, in our own schools, we're not teaching an appreciation for what we have. What is the responsibility of the Christian in a democratic society, Montgomery asks, and he answers. As Reinhold Niebauer puts it, the preservation of a democratic civilization requires the wisdom of the serpent and the harmlessness of the dove. The children of light must be armed with the wisdom of the children of darkness, but remain free from their malice. They must have this wisdom in order that they may beguile, deflect, harness, and restrain self-interest, individual and collective, for the sake of the community. This means that participation in the democratic processes is obligatory, not optional, for Christians. Unlike the sectarians, we must not run from government as an evil, but must realize that we have a holy responsibility to prevent evil and promote the good. This means a political vocation if we are called to it, but we're all ha- we all have the vocation of citizen. And Luther wrote, Montgomery quotes here, there is need in this office of the office of politician of abler people than are needed in the office of preaching. For in the preaching office, Christ does the whole thing by his spirit, but in the government of the world, one must use reason. You heard that from an admission counselor at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. Here I am quoting Luther saying, there is much more of a need of able-bodied men in the office of politician than there is in the office of pastor. For the man who is a pastor is just an instrument, a tool. God is doing all the work. But in the government of the world, the politician must also use reason. Ha! Oh, good stuff. It means also an intelligent concern for and awareness of political issues and problems, a vital active citizenship, the popular judgment. Montgomery says that religion and politics should not be discussed in polite conversation is as wrong in the one case as it is in the other. And Christ's warning that because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth to revelation to that should be pondered both theologically and politically, both by the Christian church (laughs) and by the Western democracies. Amen, amen. We're going to take a break. When we get back, we're going to talk to Pastor Schulteis about the imagination, and then we'll wrap up for this week. Thanks for sticking with us. We'll be right back. You're listening to Cross Defense. Don't go over. Listen to KFUO wherever your day takes you. Download the KFUO radio, iOS, or Android app to your mobile device. You can listen to our 24-7 live stream, find all of our podcasts, browse our program schedule, or record a comment to send directly to KFUO. Just search for KFUO radio in your favorite app store. KFUO radio, Christ for you, anytime and anywhere. Okay, we are back for our last segment of today's show, and we have our guest back with us. Pastor Schulteis, how are you today? Hey, doing well, and yourself? I'm wonderful. Thanks for joining us for uh, another Cross Defense, talking more awesome. about the imagination. What do you have for us? Glad to. Yeah, so I thought we would, uh, we've, we've spent a good amount of time in the Old Testament in our last, oh, I don't know, several segments, right? And uh, I thought we should start getting our way into the New Testament, though, of course, we've always been using the Old Testament uh, to you know get a sneak peek into the New Testament, because that's how it works. That's how our Lord gives it to us. But I thought we'd get a little more intentionally into the uh, the imaginative gifts in the New Testament today. Awesome. And uh, yeah, look at it. Uh, look at the imagination uh, with new, or new, look at the New Testament with our uh, redeemed imagination. So yeah, okay. we'll do that a little bit. Sounds great. You know, I, uh, I don't know if you in fact, I do know you probably were not listening to the beginning of the show, and we were we were in a book by a, a guy who I know you're familiar with, Montgomery. Yes, yes. And okay. we were talking about democracy and Christianity, and he points out in in this little dialogue about uh, Christianity and democracy that he quotes 
who does he quote? I've already forgotten. He quotes a guy who, who says that democracy uh, didn't originate with Christianity, but really it comes to fruition because of hmm. Christianity, the New Testament, right? Mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. that once we understand that that the Lord died for all souls, for all of us, that sure. every single person mm-hmm. is valuable, like it changes mm-hmm. the whole game, right? It definitely does. Yeah, there, there's a really there's a lot to be said for that. Just the way that you know, the way that the Christian, the true story of the gospel, right? The, the Christian message, uh, Christ's life and death has. You know, it has ramifications not just in story and literature and imagination like we talk about a lot, but just every part of life, right? Every facet right. of life from, you know, the early church, it, it, was a, it was a common thing for Christians to take care of widows and orphans and hospitals. And that was just an unknown kind of unparalleled thing in the ancient Roman world. And yeah, that's a great example of that too, just in terms of our own, you know, political life and system we live in. And, you know the science and the arts, of course, uh, right, are impacted right. by by God's gift uh, to us in the scriptures, and you know Christ's life and, uh, and death and resurrection for us. It it just spills over everywhere, right? I mean that's that's one of the yeah. joys of this kind of endeavor here. How excited! Take us into the New Testament um, as we yeah. shift into Jesus and um, you know, absolutely where it all starts so, to change. Exactly, and I, and I think really what I one of the things I want to you know. Every every Bible passage I'm going to look at today, or at least try to give us a, a glimpse, if we don't look at it in detail, at least mention, um, focus really on the the reality of the incarnation, right? Okay. And uh, looking at looking at the gift of the incarnation as both kind of the, right the, the combination of lots of different things. Uh, C.S. Lewis talked about the birth of Jesus as uh, the great myth that became fact. Now he he talked about myth as not something that is false or made up or manufactured like we often think of myth today. He he understood that the word myth meant something that was a vehicle for truth. You know, so all these different pagan stories and fairy tales and things were myths and they carried an element of truth within them while being, you know, fictional stories. But in Christianity, uh, he saw elements of myth that is truth but with the one important exception, the very important uh, exception, and in fact, the, the essential one, that this really happened. Right? Christianity is the one story that really took place, uh, that Jesus died and rose again, not in a mythical world as far as like the, the Roman pantheon and the, the pagan gods and goddesses, not once upon a time, right? not in a galaxy far, far away, but in, in reality, in, in history, you know, in the days when Caesar Augustus right, and Quirinius was governor of Syria. And uh, Pontius Pilate, right? Jesus is crucified under Pontius Pilate. And so uh, th- this just brings about the, the fact that uh, the Christian story has, you know, as we talked about a few minutes ago, has this overflowing impact on everything, including the imagination, and that, that God speaks to us with his word, but these, this, this word comes to us in imaginative ways. And I think if we see all of that grounded and centered in the incarnation, then looking at the New Testament and then you know, going back and forth, Old and New Testament, you will see... You will see Jesus, right? You will see his words, his gifts, uh, his his um, his gift of word and image and imagination that, that kind of comes unpacked to us. Let me give a quick example of what I'm talking about here. Okay. Um, you know, when we think of the gift of the imagination, sometimes I think it might be tempting for us to think, well, this this gift of the imagination is kind of an abstract sort of ethereal thing, right? Mental pictures, words and things in your head or, you know, videos in your mind, that kind of language. But I think really the gift of the imagination, we need to think about it in a more concrete way. And a quick example, right? If I tell somebody like my kids, I, I will tell them to okay, look out your window or maybe a little bit more descriptively, right? keep your eyes peeled for a FedEx truck. Uh, we're not, you know, we're using metaphors, but, you know, we're not really literally telling them to take a carrot peeler and peel their eyes. <laughs> but, but what that imaginative word, right, that what that metaphor and that language is doing is communicating an abstract idea of, of looking outside and using a concrete way to do it, right? Um, you know, when Jesus, uh, a good biblical example of this, right? When Jesus wants to tell us he loves us, and, and he certainly does say he loves us in those very clear words, and that's not an abstract word by any means, but just to make it more, even more concrete, right? he says he's the good shepherd and he lays down his life for us, the sheep, right? For us. And that is not an abstract way of hearing about Jesus, but it's a very real concrete way. Now we have to understand what shepherds are and how they take care of sheep and what Jesus is like as a shepherd and how he is our shepherd and how he lays down his life for us, the sheep. But those things can be unpacked by looking at the scriptures, like looking at the context, looking at what Jesus is saying, looking at a little bit of history, what were shepherds doing, and you know, these kinds of things. Um, so anyway, that that's just to make the point that the gift of the imagination is not meant to be 
abstract or unclear, but rather I think God gives us this gift to take what is maybe unclear or hard to understand and then make it more concrete, more clear, more understandable for us, right? Now, this is how he reveals himself to us in his word, and I think why in his word so often we see him using you know, images, right? Illustrative language, um, right? Psalm 23 kinds of stuff. Uh, Jesus, I am sayings in John, right? I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, the life, right? I am the door. You know, very concrete, real earthly things uh, that he gives us his blessings with. Yeah, kind of like the sacraments in that way too, almost, right? He gives us bread and wine, right? water, words, and he, he forgives us with that. So th that's just kind of a, I don't know, a, a preparatory thought uh, before we launch into a few you know, scriptural examples of that. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, maybe you're going to go here, but if we don't talk yeah. about it today, make a note. Uh, I'll make a note as well. Let's mm -hmm. talk about in, in the future sometime the distinction between a lot of this language we get, you know, when you're talking about peeling your eyes, keeping your eyes peeled, and then, and then you went <laughs> yeah. to the, the shepherd and we are the sheep and, and all this picture language. I think we should do an episode and maybe do the entire hour where hmm. we make sure we're, we're clear on um, the distinction between the metaphors that the Lord uses when he's talking in metaphor language, but then also, you know, this language of this is my body, this is my hmm. blood. Because I know there are some, especially if, you, if they're recovering from um, American evangelicalism, right? They, they may have some hang-ups here, not understanding that distinction. So let's just sure. uh, make a mental note, or, or I heard your clicking of the pen, so you probably... I was, yep, I was jotting a few notes down awesome. there. <laughs> and I'll do the same I thing think, just after the show. And uh, for sure. let's spend some time on that, because I think you know, the I imagination be... has to deal with that too. And I don't want Absolutely. anybody to get lost in, in those waters. Okay, yeah, so I, I think that's a great, I think it's a great idea. Let's, yeah, let's pencil that in for sure. Awesome. All right, listener, you uh, heard it. Keep us accountable. Here we go. That's right. <laughs> that's right. You, you can you can throw the proverbial uh, digital book at us, right? If, we, if you don't. Right. <laughs> so, uh, I was reminded as I was looking for I was looking for and looking through a few different scripture passages that re really focus our on our hearts and minds and also our imagination on the incarnation, right? the, the central gift of God doing His image making work, you know, in the flesh and blood of the God Man Jesus and. So a number of passages came to mind, and before those passages came to mind, or maybe in the middle of it, somewhere along the lines, uh, the, the Martin Luther quote, and I can't remember where he said it, so I'm sure somebody could find a good citation for it. I, I didn't dig too deep to find it, but uh, you know, he said if you want to find God or if you want to look for God, you, you don't need to look up. You shouldn't look up, but rather you should look down, right? Uh, not up to the heavens, but down to earth, down to the cross, and down to the cradle, down to the manger. And uh, of course, Luther was going at get, getting at a lot of different important theological topics there, the, the theology of the cross, not looking for him in the heavens and the glorious kinds of things, but in the ordinary, simple, humble means, right? His birth for us, uh, his life, his death for us. Um, but I think in that also there's a there's a key or a, maybe a, a guide for our imaginations too uh, that, you know, again, looking at the the gift of the imagination is something that is concrete that God gives us, and he himself comes to us in a very concrete, tangible way. Uh, so a good – well, one of the great passages that talks about this is in John 1.14, of course. We hear this usually around Christmas time, uh, but the word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? And we have beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, you know, there's, we could do a, probably a whole segment on what this eternal word of the Father is, but, you know, in a lot of times in the Old Testament, the word of the Lord comes to so-and-so, and, -so, and it, it's described not just as like a, a speaking voice, like in their whispering in their ears kind of thing, but it's described as, a, as some kind of tangible, visible form of, of Christ, right? Christ before he becomes incarnate, and uh, he, he leads Abraham out, example, for example, to look at the stars in the heavens. Uh, and Jeremiah kind of drags by the arm and gives him his prophecy in certain parts. And you know, so when we get to John, uh, John is now telling us this eternal word that's been living and active since before the foundation of the world is now coming to be present to you, to live, to live and be active and to dwell among you um, in human flesh, right? uh, in, uh, in the substance of our mortal nature, right? to assume humanity in, into himself in the Godhead, as we say in like, the Athanasian Creed. You know, and the word that is really fun there in John 1, and I'm sure a lot of folks have heard this from their pastors in Bible class or sermons, but it's just worth repeating that when uh, the word there says dwelt or um, lived among us, uh, the, the Greek word behind that is the same Greek word 
that's used in the Greek Old Testament translation uh, of the Hebrew for uh, the tabernacle, right? To be tabernacled, to tent among you, to dwell among you. So, you know, not only is John drawing on this eternal word language, but he's also calling our imaginations, with a little bit of help from the languages, uh, back to this uh, this reality of God dwelling with His people in the tabernacle and in the sacrifices and in the whole kind of Old Testament divine service. Now all of that is happening in this Jesus, in this person of Jesus. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, isn't it interesting how you just said, with a little help from the language, isn't that yeah. interesting how the imagination is embedded in the actual language? Yep, and both are, you know, sometimes there's there's this temptation, right, to pit our, our reason and our imagination against each other. Or to pit word and you know creativity against each other, uh, right. or create you know to pit the imagination and the written word as contradictory, but they're they're complementary, and I, I think this is a good example of how you can't separate those two, right? You're right. You just know, that, I, just I, as I, Jesus is one Christ, right? God and man, uh, you know, true God, true man, and, and, you know, the word and the imagination, the word and the image, both <laughs> are, are are God's gifts. Right? Oh, this is one of those mind melting moments. I'm just loving this. Because I, I did an episode, uh, I think it was last week's episode. Uh, I don't know. Somebody have to check. I, I just move on after the episode, right? Um, of, <laughs> of talking about Neil Postman's Technopoly, and mm. and he, you know, in, I'm still reading the book. I'm finishing it up, and he made this reference to you're talking about computer technology and how mm -hmm. the he was talking about metaphor. He was talking about language and how we talk mm. about computers as if they're human, and then therefore <laughs> yeah. we start talking I'd... about humans as if they're computers. Mm -hmm. It's embedded in the language. And his yeah. point was when the first time, and he and he cited the the article that it was written in, where the vi mm. very first time computers were talked about as having a virus, and mm. it wasn't just one phrase; mm. it was a, a whole slew. Uh, you know, the the author of the mm. article that was relaying this event that happened to a bunch of computers. I think it was in Stanford or something, uh, pre mm. you know worldwide internet when it was still just sort of mm. on a campus, and how all the, the computers on the network. Were suffering from this virus, and it, the author of that article used this sickness language that that it relates to humans because it was the yeah. best metaphor for what was right. happening to the computer, right? Because there was no way to talk about yeah. that. And, and then he started shifting and talk. And his real point was talking about how the opposite then happens, and now we start to talk about like our ability to process information as like mm -hmm. recalling data. And you know, all right. the, we're, we're using computer language to talk about the mind and things. So all of that hmm. was in my brain, mm -hmm. as you just mentioned, that the, with a little help from the the language you said, you know, John's giving us hmm. imaginative cues here, but with some help from the that is, oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, thanks, yeah, just, Sam. Yeah, Go just again. Oh, you're welcome. Just that that combination, right? That that complementary nature of. You know, word and image of reason and imagination, and it, that's I, I'm I'm never one to uh, be either or. I think it's a both and, right? With that, so yeah, yeah. Sorry, okay. And you probably had a lot more content prepared for right now, but uh, we still no, have some okay. time to talk about. It. Sorry, I, I took us on super. A little, no, uh, no, detour. that's okay. Uh, that's a good detour, right? There, there, there are good, there are good rabbit trails, and that was one for sure. <laughs> <laughs> what else you got for uh, us? Where are we going? Yeah, so um, I'm going to mention two passages. We won't look at those uh, in detail today, but I, I want to skip to one, but I'll mention them first. So the, the, kind of mm -hmm. the three other passages that came up as I was looking at this, uh, this idea of you know, image and incarnation together, and again, looking, looking down at Christ who became, you know, came down for us. Uh, you know, looking up Colossians 1, verse 15 and following, is it, I encourage anybody listening to try and do that and, and look at it with the same kind of reason, word, and imagination idea that we're talking about here that we saw in John 1 14 because Christ is called by Paul there the image of the invisible God right, in uh, Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1 does a similar kind of thing too that uh, you know in many and various ways God spoke to his people of old by the prophets but now in these last days right, he's spoken to us by his son and he is the he's the icon there uh, the language and the image that is used there in Hebrews is one of like a coin being made right where it's stamped and imprinted and the obverse is there on the, the printed metal or the, you know, the, the metal that the coin is used from the, from the stamp itself or whatever is used. And that's, so there, there's a shared likeness there. There's a shared, as we would say, understandably so, I mean, uh, a, a oneness, right? A, well, a divine essence, a sharing of that because it's father, son, and Holy spirit. It makes sense. Yeah. We understand that in our confession, but it's, it's cool to see how the, 
uh, the language of you know coins and uh, stuff like that works its way in there. Right? So the one I want to kind of close up with or wrap up with is First Corinthians 15. Okay. So you know First Corinthians 15, we read it and hear it at Easter a lot. And uh, check out these words from uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 48 through 49. So the first man was of the earth, made of dust, right? Adam, right? and he made in God's image, right? There's that image word again. Yeah. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. Right? Dust you are, to dust you shall return. We'll hear in a few weeks on Ash Wednesday. And as is the heavenly man, right? Jesus, the second Adam, so also are all those who are heavenly. As we have been born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So Christ comes and right, takes on the image of man that he made himself in his own image in the first place back in creation so that he can redeem us, body and soul. And I think we should include in that also our, right, our reason, our imagination, and all our senses. So our imagination as well as our body and soul and life is redeemed by Christ. Uh, and often he reveals this salvation, right? This great gift of renewing, of recreating, and making us new in his own image. And he does it in imaginative ways, of course. Right? Uh, he does it uh, right, by calling us sheep, and he's the shepherd. Uh, he is the vine. We are the branches. Uh, um, he, is the, he is the high priest, and we are the ones uh, for whom he lays down his life and uh, you know, Living covers stones. us. Yeah, right? Living stones, another fantastic image. And yet also at the same time, a, a true image, a reality, not just a, not an abstract thing, but a concrete thing. Right. Because we have, we have very real concrete sins and we have a very, <laughs> thankfully, real concrete, tangible, uh, right, touchable, hearable savior, right? John 1, uh, 1 John talks about how uh, we saw his glory and we touched and we were able to see and all these wonderful things, you know, a very earthly thing. And that's good because he's also earthly and heavenly at the same time. And Amen. brings us up with him. Yeah. We've got to wrap up, brother. Thank you for. Uh, I was going to ask you to leave us with a, a bit of gospel, just in case we didn't get it, but you just mm. you just gave it to us. So uh, thank awesome. you so much for all of that. It's always a Glad pleasure. You. I just want to make sure you know how much we appreciate having you here on Cross Defense. You, you oh. melt my mind every single time. And well, glad to. It's it's a lot of fun to be hanging out with you and chatting That's about great. things we love doing. So. so thanks very much. We'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. God's blessings. And for the listener, this has been Cross Defense. You are listening to the Reverend Tyrell Bramwell and Sam Schulteis. He is pastor out in Milton, Washington at Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. So if you're in the area, we'll stop by and, and say hello. And we'll talk to you next Monday. Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org.